Good morning, everybody. Uh, great to be here in Henderson, Nevada. Uh, my name is Jim Kelsey. I'm president of KW Engineering. And uh, we're a, what I would call a, a small uh, energy engineering firm, uh, consulting engineers based in Oakland, California, with uh, about 50 employees. I say that that's, that's small because of a lot of our competitors who do energy audits and retro commissioning are you know, multinational firms. Uh, on the other hand, for a firm that uh, focuses on energy efficiency and consulting uh, uh, around RCX um, and uh, commissioning of buildings, we're kind of big. Uh, a lot of the uh, energy audit world in particular has been small and fragmented, and that's kind of part of what I want to talk to you about uh, about this morning. Um, so I've personally been doing energy audits about 25 years. Um, so this is a subject that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, is anybody chilly in here? I had to go get like a cup of tea because it's, anybody got a thermometer on them? Oh, come on. Bunch of, uh, bunch of commissioning engineers, no thermometers in the crowd? All right. But, but uh, it's, I guess, yet to be determined if uh, what happens in Henderson stays in Henderson. Uh, but we'll, we'll uh, have to find out or find out about that. All right, I've, I have it on, on word from the hotel staff. I'm the 27th person to make that joke this week, and it's, <laughs> it's Wednesday. So, uh, all right, let's get started. So uh, what I'm going to cover is a little bit about ASHRAE audit levels, uh, how those levels are defined. Uh, a little bit of summary of what is expected uh, in those uh, audit levels, and uh, some on-site techniques, a little bit about how to make uh, turn energy audits into a tool to get things done instead of a report to, that sits on a desk. Uh, and I'm going to throw in some cool tools and resources uh, to help you out, um, hopefully some stuff that you haven't heard of. Um, as I said, this subject is very near and dear to my heart, and part of the reason that uh, Ray asked me to be here today is that I was the primary author for ASHRAE's uh, book that defines the uh, ASHRAE audit levels one, two, and three. That's the procedures for commercial building energy audits. And I'm also the chair of ASHRAE's committee that is turning that book into a standard now. So uh, like I said, this is near and dear to my heart. So everybody thinks that they can do energy audits. I'm sure everybody here can do energy audits. And uh, your chiller vendor can do energy audits. And your lighting vendor can do energy audits. And contractors can do energy audits. And that has been a little bit of a, of a problem for this field. Um, when I look at the, uh, this commissioning organization, you all have really kind of got your stuff together. Uh, in terms of defining how things should be done and credentialing, uh, uh, you know, credentials for practitioners. Uh, that's all very down. But uh, in the energy audit world, it's been a little bit of the Wild West. And so that's a, tr a kind of a problem that we've tried to solve. Um, so energy audits are, are easy to do. Uh, anybody with a digital camera and a clipboard can say that they're an energy auditor, uh, but your results may vary. Uh, there's a lack of standard methods, lack of consistent reports, and uh, you, sometimes occupant safety and health can get compromised in, in the process. And so we need to maintain those things. Uh, it might not be quite as easy as it seems. So our first attempt at that was back in 2004, ASHRAE published this, uh, what we now call the Yellow Book. This was the original procedures for commercial building energy audits. I'm sure many of you have seen it. And the whole point of this book was to help standardize the industry uh, around uh, what constitutes the definitions of the audit levels. And it also provided some forms for you to use. And, we've, and, and basically, the, the idea in there that you could take audit levels one, two, and three uh, and, and define those scopes of work. Uh, it was an idea that uh, must have been very kind of 
the market was very much ready for that idea because it adopted it, and, and now everybody talks about ASHRAE levels one, two, and three. And uh, you know, whether or not they talk about them correctly is another story, and that's part of what I'll address today. But um, so this book came became a de facto standard, and then in 2011 we updated it uh, into this what we call the Green Book. This is the second edition, and uh, it's costs about 100 bucks and is a great resource um, for two reasons. One, it defines those ASHRAE audit levels very clearly in terms of what you need to do to call an audit, ASHRAE level one, level two. Uh, also, it's got a, a much more developed section of best practices. So if you want to learn how to do energy audits, it's a great place to, to start or a great place to point your, your staff who you want to, uh, to teach. So, um, and then it's got a lot of great resources in it. We, uh, we had a, a lot of online forms that we published with this book. You can get the forms actually without even buying the book. Um, I can give you the URL, URL at the end of my presentation. But um, So there are these audit forms and uh, great lists of energy efficiency measures to consider. Uh, checklists of how to do simulations. There's a lot of great resources that, uh, that were compiled along with this book. So one of the things that we did not address in uh, updating that book was uh, the term audit. We decided to leave it procedures for commercial building energy audits because that name had already been adopted by a number of different uh, uh, you know, authorities who, who decided to use that book as the standard, and so we left it audits. Probably would be better to call them energy assessments. Uh, you know, as a marketing tool, saying that you're selling audits is, a, is an uphill battle. You know, most people think of an audit as something that, you know, the IRS is knocking on your door, uh, or, or in this case, our city council member was facing an audit. You face an audit. You don't, you know, get to have one. So. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't address that, um, but maybe, maybe future work. So what are these audit levels? Well, first, a little bit about what they are not. They are not three versions of the same thing. They are also not a continuously variable scale of things. And if you're trying to follow along in your notes, most of the slides correspond, but it's not a one-to-one. -one, so. um, people, I, I've had clients say, we want a one-plus audit. Well, okay, what is that? That is, uh, they want to get a, a level two audit, but they want to pay for a level one audit. I think that's, <laughs> that's the answer there. So uh, the, the scope of work is actually pretty well defined in that book. There's some level, of, some flexibility, and we're still kind of cranking that down in terms of how tight it's going to be when we go from the book to the standard. Uh, but they're re it's really not a continuous uh, scale of things. The levels are intended to build upon one another. So an ASHRAE level two audit needs to, it, it, it uh, includes all of the scope of work of an ASHRAE level one plus additional work. An ASHRAE level one audit includes all of the scope of work from a preliminary energy use analysis, which is sort of like a level zero, uh, before you even get to a level one. So they build upon each other like this. So first you start with your preliminary energy use analysis and then uh, build upon that with a walkthrough audit, build upon that with a level two audit, and then the level three is, is more than that. And I will uh, I'll go through some detail on, on kind of what each of those means. In any auditing exercise though, uh, there is a lot of kind of on-the-go balance. There's this constant balance between how much time do I spend on a site, what is the potential for energy savings there versus how much, how much it costs. Uh, one of, one of uh, our engineers uh, calls himself Megawatt Man. I am Megawatt Man because you walking around at, if you bill out at 125 bucks an hour, then you have to find a megawatt worth of savings to pay for yourself instantaneously. So think about that. That's a big goal 
for, uh, for your work on a site. So there's this constant balance between level of depth and what you can find, and that's every energy auditor's job to balance that appropriately for their client. Uh, now that has posed a big problem for us in terms of making standards of definitions for thou shalt do this, this, and this uh, in an energy audit, because as soon as you start adding thou shalts, then you define the scope of work and you don't give the energy auditor room to follow their nose a little bit. So that's a, a, an issue that we continue to struggle with. But there's a constant balance there. There's great things that you can do before you go to a, a site. Um, and this is sort of the area of the preliminary energy use analysis. Before you go on site, you want to know the basics about it. Uh, at the very least, you want to benchmark your site. And I've got a couple of options here for uh, methods of, of benchmarking your site. Of course, EPA's Energy Star Portfolio Manager is a great way of benching your, uh, benchmarking your site, uh, particularly if you fit well into their category of building types. Um, but there are some other tools. Uh, this is one that is still under development, um, so it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's a great tool. That's the Billing Performance Database from LBNL. Uh, and it will let you very quickly select a sample group of buildings that are similar to yours. You can select by building type, by square footage, by vintage, uh, by geography, and uh, define the own, your own sample set that you want to benchmark your buildings against. So uh, that's a great resource. Uh, similarly, uh, Energy IQ, also from LBNL, uh, is a, a site that lets you define the, the subgroup that you want to benchmark against. And uh, Energy IQ has two data sets that it will let you benchmark your buildings against. The CBEX beta, uh, data set, which is the nationwide DOE uh, source of benchmarking data. And then it also contains uh, what we call the SUS data set. So this is California specific, California end use survey data. Um, but a great benchmarking tool for comparing your building to others, others like it. And it lets you do some great graphs where you can look at uh, which percentile you lie relative to your peers, uh, which is great ammo for holding up to the building owner and saying, you know, like, hey, you're in the bottom half of the buildings out there. You know, uh, we, we can make some improvements. So, so that's all about bench, uh, benchmark. Oh yeah, one more side I had. If you're doing a, a lab, labs have you know super high ventilation rates, and so uh, totally different data set to compare yourself there uh, uh, to other labs. And Labs 21 developed this benchmarking data set uh, for labs that you can use, and it's Labs 21 Benchmarking LBL .gov. Uh, also lets you pick similar peer groups by geography and the type of lab that it is. Um, so those are some, some resources for you to use. Of course, most people like to benchmark against their own buildings if they have, a, uh, if you're looking at a portfolio of buildings. Uh, this is an example from a school district and it's pretty easy to see where, uh, where you know, the schools that need attention are. The scale here is, this happens to be therms per square foot. Uh, and all of the elementary schools in this school district, and we're comparing like to like. Actually, we, we see a significant difference between elementary and middle and high schools. Um, of course, if you have, if you're talking to a commercial building portfolio and they're spread out over geography, if you wanted, you can do this, but then you have to correct for weather data, uh, you know, for weather at, at your various sites, which you can do, it's just, work. Right? Um, other things that we like to rely on before going on site. Uh, we call them spy cams. Uh, anybody recognize this facility? Nobody? Oh yeah, you're sitting right under here. Uh, this is this building. Uh, so uh, make use of the tools that you have. You know, uh, Google uh, the, the Street View uh, maps that they have are amazing, uh, and the satellite views even. Like, look if I, if I zoom in on this building. Look at that. I have four cooling towers. I know that before I even went to the site. 
So some of the companies that are doing quote, and I use my quotes pronounced here, no touch and virtual audits, um, they, are, they are using these satellite imagery with other data to kind of to do those approaches. Um, I'll come back to that at the end if we have time. That's a whole nother, don't get me started on virtual audits. So, um, so that was all kind of preliminary before the site info. Uh, then we have our level one walkthrough. And it really is just that, it's a, it's a walkthrough. The intent of a level one is to scope measures at a site. It's not to fully develop projects. Um, so what do you do? You do your preliminary energy use analysis, your benchmarking, you do a walkthrough survey, you meet with the owner, you do a space function analysis. So uh, we do ask that you, you understand for that building how much of the building is office space, how much of it is data center when you do your, your benchmarking. Uh, and then you identify low cost and no cost and capital improvements. And you need to put some rough numbers with those. Nobody expects those to be final numbers with a preliminary walkthrough audit. And then in the report for that site, you estimate savings from a re utility rate change. Now this is something we're probably going to leave out of future versions because rate analysis is a field all its own. Um, and, but it's, it's currently written in the procedures that you in, at least need to check that the customer is on the right rate, basically. Uh, you summarize their utility data, you do the benchmarking, you estimate savings if they meet their EUI target. So that's your energy use intensity target, and I'll, I'll have a slide about that in a second. You look at total energy costs by fuel type, you identify any kinds of deficiencies, safety deficiencies, O&M deficiencies, and then develop your rough costs and savings, which is what most owners are, are looking for out of that scoping effort. So here's an example of what we mean by uh, calculating the savings to meet your target. This is just a really simple calculation. You have to you, you know what your current EUI is. That's just your kilowatt hours per square feet or KBTUs per square feet. You find your, in this case, we're setting our target as the average EUI. If you've got this facility up to average uh, or down to average, I guess, in terms of EUI, what would your potential savings be? And then what is that in terms of a percentage? That just lets you know how far you have to go to meet your target. Uh, we don't say in the procedures what target you have to choose. That's up to you. Um, but, you know, a lot of people use Energy Star as a, as a target. I'd like to get my Energy Star rating. Uh, or I want to get X number of lead points, and that will identify a target for you. Um, so really, the emphasis here is on a level one audit is really, is there potential here? Should we dig, dig deeper? Uh, and if so, Roughly where is that potential and roughly how much is that potential? That's the whole point. So these are some of the other components that you include in a level one audit, uh, a basic utility data summary. Uh, I only put this up here because I know everybody can do this in their sleep, um, but a lot of people do it wrong in their sleep, which is they forget to do this in terms of kilowatt hours per day. And if you look at monthly billing data, some Utility billing periods have 28 days, and some of them have 32 days, and you don't want to in introduce that variability in here. So if you do this on a kilowatt hour per day basis, you get rid of, uh, of that little issue. So that's kind of the rough run by on level one. Level two is probably the most popular level that we have uh, our clients ask us for. This is an energy survey, you know, a detailed energy survey and analysis. And this is the one I put the little lead uh, logo on there because this will get you lead points. This or a commissioning study of your existing building uh, will get you lead points. So the process is the same, only more detailed. Uh, detailed site visit, we're going to really review all of the operating conditions measure key parameters. So if there's something that's really important to your big energy savings, you should be measuring those variables. Uh, list all of your potential 
recommendations and then winnow that down to a, a list of, of actual recommendations. Uh, we're going to look at capital measures and of course meet with the owners and operators and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. And then you develop your ASHRAE Level 2 audit report. Oh, and by the way, in the latest version of, of uh, the book, w this is a level two, like uh, Arabic two. We're not, we're not doing II anymore. So, yay, big changes. All right. Um, so your report will estimate low cost, no cost savings, uh, perform a detailed end use breakdown, and I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, estimate costs and savings. That's, of course, what most owners really want. Uh, it includes a complete description of the equipment of the building. Uh, now, this is not, doesn't have to be down to the doorknob, but uh, you know, the major energy using equipment in the building. Um, recommended M&V methods for any big measures that you want to do. Recommend how you want to document those savings. And then finally, a financial analysis of those recommended energy efficiency measures. So one of the things that uh, you need to do in a level two audit is capture interactive effects. So this is interactive effects among end uses and up through systems. So the example I have here is uh, a light bulb in a, a walk-in cooler. If I, if I replace that, uh, if that was, for instance, an incandescent, and I, I changed it out to a CFL, I would see lighting energy savings, and then I also see refrigeration system savings. Both of those savings are supposed to be captured in a level, in a level two audit. Uh, then you provide uh, recommended uh, bundles of measures where that's, a, where that's appropriate. Because of those interactive effects, if you leave out some measures, the energy savings from other measures change. So that is supposed to be re uh, reflected in those bundles. You can work with the owner to minimize the number of bundles that you need to look at so you're not doing too much work. Uh, and then generally analyze up from loads to heat rejection. So that is the direction that you take for capturing interactive effects. And I've got it here, shown here, starting from loads all the way up through heat rejection. So this is the same way that energy simulation tools account for interactive effects. You need to, to do so. It's not saying you have to use hourly simulations. Um, but that your savings uh, should percolate. So the reason for that is that we don't want to analyze a cooling tower measure first and then re uh, find out that because of our air handler measures, uh, our cooling tower is running half as much as we thought it was. So if we get our economizers working, then we have less load on our chillers and less heat rejection. So that's the reason why you want to go this direction. <clears throat> and then from, from your analysis, you uh, come up with this end use allocate, uh, allocation and energy balance. So this, I've got that, that split there is on purpose. Uh, this really has two purposes. Most people know one of the purposes, which is this, this is the data for the pie chart, right? Everybody wants the pie chart. How much of my energy use is going to lighting? How much is going to HVAC? How much is going to refrigeration? That's useful information because if you know that, well, it, it gives you an idea of the potential savings associated with those systems. Most people don't think about the energy balance part, which if we could get everybody in the world to take this one single step, it would solve us all, you know, it, it would save us all a lot of grief, which is this step of making sure that your base case energy use totals the historical bills, roughly. You know, it, it, this is the lowest level of quality control that we can expect. But you'd be surprised how many times people don't do it. Now, maybe I'm not doing a comprehensive energy audit and I don't really have a great estimate for the plug loads in the buildings. Still, the exercise of estimating that, okay, grab one watt per square foot and use that for the facility. Even that ex low level exercise will help you to not overestimate the savings because if your if uh, base case estimates greatly exceed the actual use of the building, all of your energy savings estimates are going to be high. Uh, see this all the time. 
So this is one product out of that uh, allocation is the combined fuel uh, pie chart. And I uh, apologize, the things are black there. You can't see them. But everybody knows what the pie chart looks like. And um, this is, this is a, a case a little bit of be careful what you say because we said that you should do this and then kind of thought about it later. And, and really, I think the separate fuel pie charts make a lot more sense. They help you a lot more at the facility. But we said this in the book, and now lead documentation is requiring this, even though I don't think it's as, as valuable as the other one. So be careful what you ask for, I guess. Um, so this is combining everything on a KBTU basis. Uh, I, I would a lot rather see the two pie charts, one for electricity and one for natural gas, that shows, you know, uh, I can do a lot more with that information, frankly. Uh, and then uh, this is another example of the billing summary, kind of same issue that I, I showed before. And your, your level two audit should also uh, include a cost summary. So your monthly costs, gas, and electricity, or whatever other fuels you have there. Now the area that we're seeing a lot of uh, development in that is really exciting is in the use of interval data. And so I'm going to kind of do a little aside here for a moment because uh, the, the prevalence of interval meters out there and smart meters is uh, really helping to make a lot of great diagnostic data available. And so uh, that should be included in your level two work as well. So here's, for instance, a sample interval plot uh, just plotting, uh, you know, your average January versus April versus August versus peak day. And you can tell that this, this building sort of how it fluctuates over the year and how it fluctuates over the typical week really helps determine well, this is megawatt scale over here. So it's like, wow, I've got a 400 kW base load 24-7. That helps you identify some po uh, potential savings. And then looking at this interval data versus this facility, I can instantly do you know, some diagnostic stuff. Well, this is obviously a five-day-a-week facility, and that's a seven-day-a-week facility. Um, and uh, same kind of high base load. And there's a lot of other great stuff that you can do with it. This is, uh, this is our tool, but there are others that do similar ones. This is a whole, uh, like a whole year of interval data plotted for a school. And then you can zoom in on some of these areas and see what's going on. And you can see very clearly what the timeline of my uh, holiday or my uh, summer break was here and my holiday break around the end of the year. Here all stands, you can even see spring break right here. So this stuff uh, really helps to determine operating hours for the facility and base loads and a lot of diagnostic value. Uh, if you start looking at those daily load profiles, you can find uh, little hitches. Uh, for instance, uh, I've got one a little bit later, but uh, this one shows some extra use on one of the weekend days that I probably should track down. Um, this one shows my total annual peak over the, oops, over the course of a day relative to my average weekday. Uh, so a lot of great diagnostic value available from this interval data. So make sure that you get it when you can and uh, find a tool to, to make use of it. Uh, this is another way of presenting that interval data in terms of a, of a calendar heat map. So this is, this, imagine a, an annual calendar turned 90 degrees on its side. So this is a, from tw starting in 2013. Each one of these columns is a week, and each one of these squares is a day. And so I can, this red day on September 7th, 2013, hit my peak for the year. So I can identify exactly when that, when that peak occurred. And I can see for this facility, I've only got maybe one week a year that is probably pushing my, uh, my peak for the whole year. And it, depending on what kind of rate they're on, that could be important or not. Uh, but anyway, good diagnostic value for the energy auditor. And then uh, the load duration curve is also one that shows uh, a lot of diagnostic value. So this is just plotting for my observed KW over the course of the year. If I took the highest 
interval period and then the next highest and the next highest and stack them in order, that, that creates a load duration curve. And so that tells me, you know, sort of within how many hours of, I can see like five of these periods of the year are adding, uh, you know, all the way from 200 and uh, about, let's see, about 240 all the way up to 200, 270 peak KW. So my, shows you how many hours of the year are contributing to that peak KW. Um, and there are others that, that have tools for figuring out the, how the shape of that curve um, can help uh, identify other measures. But I don't have time to get into that today. Um, but one of the other great values that we're seeing for, um, for this interval data is being able to uh, model the energy use of a building before and after a controls change or a retrofit. And so you have so many observations over the course of the year that building data on a whole building level is actually valuable. So this is looking at the blue data here is actual uh, energy use of this facility. And then we look at a whole year's worth of that data and put it through multivariate regression analysis. And you can basically predict the, uh, this, this amber line here is the expected energy use of that day for that baseline period based on the model. And then you can forecast that model forward and see what your savings are or use that model to help identify uh, anomalies or when things go out of whack. Um, so this is a good uh, example of a, a pre-install model. This is kind of the same thing. This is the baseline model uh, over time. And for a lot of buildings, you can get a really good fit with these models. Whereas, you know, we used to do whole building analysis using monthly billing data. Uh, and there, you know, statistical N is 12 a year. And so it takes years worth of data and in that time period, stuff changes, and you never know. But you know, this, uh, these kind of 15-minute uh, data, all of a sudden, if it, if it's hourly, n is 8760. If it's if it's 15-minute data, n for a year's worth of data is 35,000. So uh, you can get really meaningful models for this stuff. And then you can project those forward. Here's an example of projecting the that data forward into the, the post-install period or the performance period. And you can see that they were still changing things through this. So this is time series data. And, but we're already seeing huge savings. This is uh, from a, uh, the commissioning of a central chiller plant uh, in California. And you can see this, these huge reductions. And, and we didn't get the reductions we expected to see on the weekend here uh, because uh, they were still tinkering with the controls. And then we, we come along and get those later. Uh, and then we, we lowered the baseline energy use even more here. So um, great way of showing what those savings are. And I didn't fill it all in, but basically the band between your expected use and your actual use is your savings. So, it's not a super accurate number like an engineering analysis, uh, but it's, uh, you know, on the other hand, you can hang your hat on it because it's what's showing up on your bills, and that's what the customer cares about. So, um, so we're a big fan of moving to uh, interval methods. If you don't have these tools uh, at home, uh, there is um, a free tool that's an Excel add-in that will help you do some of the plots that I just showed you. Uh, and that is called ECAM. Uh, and it's energy, oh dear, I've forgotten the energy calculation and, and measurement or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it was developed by Bill Curran, who's now with Northright, uh, great guy. And it's available for free on, in the resources page of the California Commissioning Collaborative website. So that's CACX.org. If you go to CACX.org, you can download ECAM, and then it, it's just a little add-in to Excel, 
and then it'll help you do a lot of these plots with interval data and, and other uh, logging data. So here's some examples of that same kind of stuff from ECAM, uh, daily load profiles. Uh, you can look at, uh, here's your load duration curve, scatter plots for diagnostic analysis of air temperatures. So this, was, this is a great one for commissioning folks especially. Um, and it, oh, that one's not air temperature. Sorry, this is KW. But they do have, you can do it with, with air temperatures. Um, you can spot things right away. Uh, one of these things is not like the other. We were looking at this data showing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday daily low profiles, and this purple one sticks out. Now, the scale again here is really big. This is uh, average total power. This is 2,500 kW. So the difference between those top two lines there is about 75 kW, which is, and this was all because Thursday was old chiller day, and so they, they just wanted to keep runtime on this chiller to keep it operational. And so uh, they just moved old chiller day from Thursday that had significant load to Saturday, which had a much smaller load and didn't affect their peak. So they saved uh, 75 kW peak there. So getting back to level two analysis, um, one of the things that we recommend that everybody do before leaving a site is to list all of the energy efficiency measures that you have uh, gathered in your investigation on the site and go over it with the building owner right there that day or the, the, the chief engineer or somebody that knows the facility well. Um, this does a couple of things. One thing it does is it makes sure that the ideas that you have are, you know, are valuable and that we'll, we'll go forward. Um, the real, you know, the other big value there is that it gets them bought into the process. You know, an energy audit should never be a us and them kind of experience. It should be a team building thing. That's, you know, the first thing you should do going to a site is to meet with the building staff and see what kind of ideas they have because they have good ideas and the ideas that they come up with you know are going to get done at the site. So, so we like to do this uh, review of recommendations with uh, the relevant uh, folks on site. And then the product of that level two audit is something like this. I apologize for the, uh, the eye test, but uh, you all have seen it before. This is a, a measure summary table where you list your recommendations, you list how much energy they're going to save, how much dollars they're going to save, what's it going to cost, and what are the economics of that, uh, of that energy efficiency measure. Uh, we like to show economics uh, from life cycle costing as well as everybody wants to see simple payback. It's not a very good economic measure, but uh, everybody wants to see it, so we, we include that. So within your measure recommendations, uh, be explicit and clear. There are a lot of energy audits out there that have vague recommendations that are, are useless to a, a, a building owner. Um, I like to say organize lighting like your lighting vendors and HVAC like your HVAC vendors. So write your HVAC like a scope or as, as much as close to a scope of work as you can. Lighting vendors like room by room lighting counts. They, they want it organized that way too. They're not going to trust your numbers anyway. They're going to come back and count all those fixtures. Um, but it, it, the closer that you can get it to what they, they need, the better. Um, make it easy for the owner to follow up with. And make it, you know, an energy audit, I think of it really as, uh, well, it has a couple of pieces. One is it's a technical document, but it also needs to be a sales document. It, it needs to be promotional. You know, it, there's too many energy audits that sit on desks untouched. And so anything that you can do to, uh, to motivate the customer beyond the economics will help get energy efficiency measures adopted. So motivate them to, to action and bundle projects to avoid cream skimming. So cream skimming is when you go in and you recommend everything that's a one year payback or less. And then what you do is strand energy efficiency that, uh, that can't be done later. Um, if you bundle projects together, uh, you have a better chance of getting HVAC and lighting 
done as a package with a two and a half year payback. If you split it into lighting and HVAC, then you've got a one year lighting project that gets done and an HVAC project that never gets done because it's got a four year payback. So bundle creatively where you can. I know you can't always do that. But. Uh, within your measure recommendations in an audit, we like to group them like this. Uh, what are your observations? What did you see? Uh, what is your recommendation? What are the costs? Uh, what assumptions went into your analysis? And then specific equipment and control changes. So what equipment do I need to replace? Exactly what uh, control changes need to be made? And then other info that will help them to make their decision. Cut sheets and vendor, vendor information. If a vendor was kind enough to spend some time uh, giving you a, a cost estimate, then why not go ahead and, and throw that into the appendix of your audit? It'll have a better chance of getting uh, those projects complete. I'm going to skip past this because I don't want to run too long. I'm in the unenviable position of between, being between you and your lunch. So this is just a little bit better than the guy this afternoon that is between you and the bar. So, <laughs> all right. so uh, consider human factors. So a lot of engineers uh, tend to get in a, you know, a focus mode of operating on when it comes to energy audits and proposals that it's all about. It's all about the economics, it's all about the technical side, um, but that's not the case. Um, we need to think about the team that we're trying to build to get these projects done uh, and how you work with them. And, and that's, that's, you know, you're, you're in the middle when you get there, uh, you know, because an energy auditor comes on site, there are many chief engineers, you know, they just heard from upper management, from the Thai guys, that some auditor is going to be here to see how you're running the building. I mean, that's the worst case scenario, is that you're there to check on how they're doing. And so you need to make sure that they understand that that's not why you're there. You're there for all of us to work together to try to make this building, uh, building better. Um, on the other side of that, don't believe everything that you hear on, on a site. And in, the, in that same vein, if you are looking at a pump and, and you're saying, you know, you're doing your, your audit and asking questions about the building, you can phrase questions so that they're loaded. You know, oh, that's, that's a condenser water pump. The building's not occupied at night, so that water pump's off at night, right? Yeah. Right, you know, you can lead questions, lead people to an answer that is the right or the wrong answer by the way that you ask it. So try to be very open-ended, you know, instead of saying, you know, that doesn't run at night, does it? You know, you, know, you, want, you want to say, you know, what's the schedule? Show me. I like show me. I'm from Missouri, literally. So I like the show me questions. Show me the pump schedule in the ENS. I, want to, I just need to see it, you know. Um, so those... That, that's how I kind of handle that. Um, don't ask leading questions. In, involve the staff with uh, your development there and show me questions, right? And uh, this is my favorite Mythbusters quote. I reject your reality and substitute my own. Um, you know, first of all, I believe data more than I believe people. And then, but, you know, you have to, you have to trust the folks that at the site to a degree as well. Um, but I... Um, Reserve the right to, uh, to disagree if the data shows otherwise. So. so what do you need to get audit projects done? You need a balanced team. You need committed management. You need engaged financial staff, building engineers, contractors, vendors, uh, all, uh, all these great folks. And that's sort of the end of the level two section. So then we come to the mysterious level three. So level three energy audit is uh, basically I've never had a client ask me for a level three audit. Uh, we have done level three audits, but pretty much every one of them we have backed into by doing a level two audit, and then they say, oh, can you give us a, a, a spec for that chiller? Oh, can you write the control sequence for that? Oh, we want a little bit more uh, uh, you know, financial analysis. And, 
by the time you've done all that, you've done a level three audit. That, those are like the main differences between a level two and a level three is that level of detail, that rigor, um, and additional scope. So, so it, a level three is level two and then some. So you include detailed descriptions of recommended measures, specs, cut sheets, uh, detailed cost estimates, and life cycle cost analysis. That's what LCCA stands for. So level three requires life cycle costing. It's not hard to do. Um, there's a great life cycle cost tool on uh, Rocky Mountain Institute's website where they've, uh, they've got it all done for you if you want to use their template spreadsheet. Uh, it's in their, uh, what do they call it, retrofit, retrofit depot or something like that for on Rocky Mountain Institute. You can find it. Um, so, or give me your card afterwards if you want to find any of these re resources. I'll be happy to, to link you up. So the other thing that uh, level three is recommended is modeling or extensive measurement of some kind. So we required, uh, we required specs and drawings. And then I've got in here just a reference. I think this made it into your materials. It, it may be an eye chart. Uh, but this is also, this is, a, sorry, just a summary from the Green Book, the Procedures for Commercial Building Energy Audits uh, of, all of all of those individual steps that go into one, two, and three. So I won't go through every line of that now. A little bit about site visits. Um, you all as commissioning engineers uh, know a lot of this, so I'll move fast, but uh, basically we're there looking to interview staff, review controls, drawings, if and when they exist. We do a lot of old buildings that don't have good drawings. Uh, pick up nameplates, spot measurements, wherever you can get it, and log data uh, is great also. So on the data collection front, photos, photos, photos. Everybody should take a lot of photos. There's nothing that will convince the owner more that something needs to be addressed than a photograph of a poorly maintained piece of equipment or a situation that needs to be resolved. Um, my rule of thumb is if you don't leave the site visit with the data, you're never going to get it. And, and that's just sort of a belts and suspenders approach. But you know, you spend all day working with somebody on site. And by the end of the day, you're buddies. And you've, you know, you've had coffee together. Maybe you've talked about measures. And he says, oh, yeah, I'm going to uh, trend data from the EMS. We don't have time today. I'm going to email that to you. Maybe he will. And, uh, but, but more than likely, he won't, yeah. So uh, my rule of thumb is if you want it, leave the site with it. Uh, assume that you're not going to get it otherwise. Um, maybe that's pessimistic. I don't know. Is that a negative outlook on life? Or glass is half, glass is half empty? Uh, guilty is charged, OK. Um, and there's some, uh, some newer tools that uh, hold the promise of easing data collection. We have a, a vendor that's presenting this afternoon that I'm very interested to learn more about. The ENAT folks have a tool like this that is a, a pad-based tool for um, data collection for energy audits uh, that then uploads that data to the cloud. And then their, their competitors, kilowatt hours, we, we test drove for a while. Um, I, I think this holds promise. Uh, the, we haven't seen a. Um, I, thank you. Uh, I haven't seen the product from EMAT, so I can't con uh, comment on them. Uh, on other products like this, we've seen we sh we're still using clipboards and, and handwritten notes because it's more flexible. So, old fashioned. Uh, and there's a random nameplate. Uh, I, I guess I guess I put that on there because I like to r remind people that so many of these. I, I want to talk to the folks at, at, at Carrier and York and Train and others about their disappearing nameplates and the, 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 what is the ink that they use and where do they think these nameplates are going to go because there are so many of these that are blank, I can't tell you. Right, exactly. So we spend a lot of time on roofs. Uh, word to the wise, word to the weary. Uh, if you go on a roof before you Go through that hatch to the roof. Make sure you've got your cell phone on you. Every one of these has a story behind it. 
Uh, data collection. We get a lot of data from energy management systems. This is one way is just take a picture of the screen. There's a host of data there. That's quick and easy. Uh, the better one that I like is if you really get along well with the site guy, if you install, install Dropbox on that computer, there's an option where every time you do a screenshot, it downloads that screenshot right into Dropbox. And then you've got a nice, clean, you know, it's a screenshot. It's not a photograph of a screen. So uh, that's, that's my latest, greatest way for getting data off of energy management systems. Um, of course, you know, downloading the trend data and, and um, all of that is uh, valuable as well. Uh, we use a lot of uh, these IR guns for space temperatures. Uh, here's my jack of all trades, master of none. I call it my master of none. Um, that is, uh, it's a little tool that's got an airflow uh, uh, little station that you can monitor the feet the velocity of the air. Thank you. It's got a, a temperature probe uh, built in, and it's got a light meter built in. So it's if you're just going to carry one tool. Who makes that? Uh, I don't recall. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know offhand. Give me your card and I'll, I'll send it to you. Uh, we use a lot of clamp meters too. Uh, I know that clamp meters don't give you true power. Um, we use true power uh, monitoring equipment where it's important to get power factor and where uh, a really accurate measurement. Um, a lot of amp readings are better than no true power meetings. Uh, so go back and get the true power later. Um, some data is better than none. Uh, so while we're talking about data, here's another tool for you. It's called the Universal Translator. So if you do logging on site, the Universal Translator was designed to handle logging data. And so you may have one measurement that is every, a temperature measurement that occurs every five minutes. And then I've got a, a pump that it only logs change of status. So it's got weird period. Universal Translator, you throw both of that data into one project, it will put them on the same scale. This will save you hours in Excel, uh, getting different logging data to, so that you can look at side by side. Uh, Universal Translator, it's at utonline.org. And you just have to sign up and they won't, they won't uh, uh, spam you or anything. So a little bit on um, the intended use of the Green Book and the, the procedures for commercial building energy audits. Um, for consumers, it was designed to set a uh, define a common standard for scope of work so they could say, I want a level one, I want a level two, and then people would know how to bid that. For practitioners, it's really uh, designed to give you uh, guidelines on that scope of work to define a common vocabulary, try and define the way that we do things as a professional community, uh, and set the standard for best practices. And as I said, the energy Auditing community is way behind the commissioning world this way, but we're, we're working on it. And so within that book, there's a bunch of great audit forms uh, for chillers and air handlers and boilers. Um, these had these data collection forms had a lot of uh, good eyes on them. Uh, my firm, KW Engineering, uh, contributed to them. Uh, Rocky Mountain Institute makes them available online. Uh, Taylor Engineering and Integral Group uh, both reviewed them as well. So they've had, uh, they've had good sets of eyes uh, on those data forms. So a little bit on um, after the audit. I'm going to skip past that. Um, on tracking results, uh, there's now a lot of software available. You could spend your whole full-time career tracking the new software entries to the energy space right now. And I've got them roughly uh, kind of divided up here in terms of companies that uh, provide submetering data. There are, uh, submetering is getting a lot cheaper uh, to upload to the cloud and to install in, in buildings. There's the whole building interval folks. 
that, uh, like examples I gave before. And then there's another level of detail in the FDD, or fault detection diagnostic world. So this is where they will take every point of your BAS and map it up to the cloud and run software to diagnose whether or not your economizer is working or whether or not your stack pressure reset is working like you think it is. Um, so that's a whole other world. That's, of course, the more expensive uh, option. And still, I think it's a quickly changing field. So we like to address persistence with tracking, uh, at least at the whole building interval data or better, uh, you know, at the piece of equipment monitoring uh, level as well, or sub, sub metered level. And then a little bit on selling efficiency. As I said, an energy audit really needs to be a, a, a promotional document. And there are many ways of promoting energy efficiency to a building owner or site staff beyond the simple economics. And many times those other things are way more compelling than economics. So other benefits, comfort, reliability, lower maintenance costs, uh, incentives. You can get a rebate to do this. It's funny, the, the impact of that free money has way more value than the money itself ought to. People don't like to leave free money on the table. Uh, there are tax deductions available uh, if you have comprehensive lighting or HVAC projects. Uh, water savings. Uh, productivity trumps everything. Uh, now, of course, this is the one that's impossible to quantify. There are a lot of studies being done to try and, and attribute productivity gains. Uh, and uh, it's sort of in the same, uh, same area as property value impacts. And now, now there, we're starting to get some real hard data on property value impacts. Uh, there's a couple of studies that show, you know, in the neighborhood of a five, five to 10 percent increase in property value. You know, that's the, that's the big number. Uh, by taking a building uh, and, and getting it either Energy Star certified or uh, LEED certified. Uh, so five to 10 percent on the building value, and that's all because of uh, increased um, increased uh, renting uh, rates. Um, you know, if you have a high occupancy of your building, the building is more profitable. It has higher value. It's simple simple economics. So do what you can to promote all of those those other uh, health and safety benefits as well. All right. <clears throat> So who's using uh, the, these books uh, right now for uh, energy audits, uh, that define energy audits? Uh, ASHRAE, of course, uh, LEED, USGBC, um, ASHRAE Building EQ, and then the cities that are adopting uh, audit, mandatory audit practices, they typically reference ASHRAE level one, two, and three. Um, the Environmental Defense Fund has what they call their Investor Confidence Project which is uh, it's a, an effort to standardize lending around energy efficiency products. So they're referencing these standards as well. Uh, ASHRAE is coming out with a whole building existing energy efficiency standard. So this is the 90.1 is for new buildings. Standard 100 is for existing buildings. It's kind of a benchmarking standard. It references these definitions. Uh, the commercial PACE programs that do financing for energy efficiency retrofits uh, and a host of others. So what next? Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm working on uh, ASHRAE Standard 211, which is turning that book into an actual standard that agencies can adopt in code language. That's in progress uh, right now. Uh, and then uh, that's being, well, we're, collaborating with ACCA on that, and also collaborating with BEADS, which is the Building Energy Data Exchange Specification. So this is a, a, an effort at LBNL that is designed to um, improve the data exchange around um, these data collection efforts. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Maybe a year. Yeah. Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. Thank you. 
Um, so other potential things coming forward uh, out of this standard, uh, a more a la carte approach for pieces of an energy audit is one possibility. Um, and I'll wrap it up with that. So thank you for your uh, attention. And um, I, since I, I ran right up to my timeline, I'll, I'll let folks go and then stick around uh, for questions for anybody that, that has them. Thank you.